In this video, I'm going to go over the John Deere Z-Track mowers. This is a Z950M. Got some work to do to it. I used to work at a John Deere dealership in the service department. And our particular dealership uh, mostly had commercial landscapers. And working on these mowers and the standards were pretty much 99% of what we did. I'm very familiar with this machine. And I'm going to show you guys some a lot of tricks and tips and things to look out for common issues and if you do need to go get it serviced at a dealership i'm going to give you guys some pointers on how to get it fixed cheaper and faster so let's get started all right first thing i want to talk to you guys about is the maintenance on these and what was most commonly overlooked by a lot of owners uh, one thing was the spindles if you're not greasing these spindles, you got that spindle there, you got a grease fitting on these three spindles. The pulleys don't have one, and the belt tensioner, I don't remember, I don't think it has one. It doesn't. No, those bearings are permanently sealed. So you have these two idlers. They don't take grease fittings, and that idler there on the belt tensioner does not take grease fittings. Uh, these spindles cost about 200, 150 and, and up to replace. That's just for the part, not including the labor. So you need to grease these. Probably I would do a couple of pumps every day. You also have some grease fittings right here for your caster bearings or the caster wheel, the fork. I call this the fork. So you got some bearings in there. And actually on this unit, the guy's missing the cover. Um, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. If you're greasing in this enough every day, you should be fine. But definitely get that cover because you can see he's got some water already in here. And that's costly to get that repaired. The most common thing after that, lack of greasing, would be not checking the oil often enough. And a lot of times customers would drop these off for another repair and I would check the oil and there wouldn't even be oil on the dipstick. And they didn't realize the amount of oil that is normally consumed by these motors. It is within spec. I don't know if it was John Deere or Kawasaki Cola or whoever the engine manufacturer is, but we were told that it's allowable tolerances is one ounce of oil per cylinder per hour. This is a two cylinder motor on all these mowers. So you got two ounces of oil per hour that's allowable consumption. These things only hold two and a half quarts. So if you run 10 hours, you've potentially consumed uh, 16 ounces of oil. First, let's talk about how to properly check your oil in these units. A lot of customers would incorrectly check the oil level and they would think they had enough oil in it because what they would do is they would check it with the cap dipstick screwed all the way in and you're not supposed to do that. Some models, you do do it that way. It'll say it on the dipstick. And this one, I can't get the camera to focus, but it says for correct oil level, do not turn cap on threads. And I'm gonna show you guys the difference. I know this unit is a little low on oil, but I'm going to show you how deceiving it can be. So here's the proper way to check it without turning it on to threads. Just put it in there. Don't screw it down. And you can see that this one is low. It is below the operating range. But if you're checking it with the threads turned and then pull it out, Now it looks like we're in the operating range. So that is not the way you want to check it. The next overlooked item that would cause lots of problems would be the fuel system. You got a fuel filter that people would never change the fuel filter. You'd get trash possibly messing up the fuel pump, messing up the carburetor, messing up the engine. One other thing to look out for 
these gas caps, the way stuff gets into your gas tank is a lot of these gas caps, this one's missing it. it the, there's an O-ring. If that O-ring is missing, some of them are black, sometimes they're kind of an orangish red color. If it's missing, guess what? I can guarantee you there's dirt. And if you're down here in Florida, there's probably sand in there too because it's not fully sealing off. So if you go to buy a used mower, you pull that gas cap off, there's no O-ring on that gas cap, you can almost guarantee there's going to be trash inside of that gas tank. And if they haven't changed that fuel filter often, this one has needs to be changed. I like to put a clear one on so you can see. John Deere, we put this clear fuel filter so you could see the trash build up. That was a very, you know, this is uh, very easy to change. All you need is a pair of pliers and put that in the correct position. And this filter is about five bucks, maybe six, seven dollars. Save you a lot of problems. An O-ring, you get order yourself a new gas cap. I don't think you can just order the O-ring, but you can probably find an O-ring that'll fit. Solve yourself a lot of problems. The next simple thing that people would overlook that would cost them lots of money would be not changing the air filters often enough. You have two air filters. So this one's clean. It, it was so rare that someone would bring in a unit and the air filter was even okay. A lot of times it was just clogged up with dirt and everything. So this is the outer filter and then you have the inner filter. And most of the time they would both be just junk. And this is, you know, $20, $30 worth of filters. Save yourself a $3,000 plus labor engine. Yeah, I'm going to, I would always tell my customers, change the oil, check your fuel filter, check your air filter, grease your spindles, and you really won't have catastrophic failures. The other thing, to change your hydraulic fluid. It doesn't need to be changed until the first thousand hours. In some units, it is a little further. One thing, the oil level, this one's a little high. The indention in the tank, you have this little notch here in the tank, and there's a slope right here. That's the operating range, that slope. So this one's not too badly overfilled. I'd often see them overfilled too much. Having This thing is tight. If you overfill it, it need, it'll, it'll cause you some issues. You want to have enough room in that tank for expansion as it gets hot. And the final thing, the simple thing that would keep people um, from spending lots of money that they wouldn't do, but they should keep it clean. Keep wash your unit, keep it clean, keep it lubricated. Check your oil every day before you use it. Check your oil and just keep an eye on everything. Um, <clears throat> if you're going, if your unit is under warranty and you take it into the dealership, if there's no grease, if it's still under warranty and you take it in for a bad spindle, we take them apart. If there's no grease in there, it's not going to be covered under warranty. When we have to do an engine under warranty, John Deere makes us take the engine apart. It wants pictures of everything in a specific way. That way they know exactly what caused the engine failure. And it it's physical evidence of what caused it. If you ran it too low on oil, it will not be covered under warranty. If you didn't change your air filters enough, if you didn't change the fuel filter, it's not going to be covered under warranty. You're going to pay it. If you keep these things maintained, filters, oil changed, you have a failure, it will be caused under it will be covered under warranty. So now let's start going over the things, the most common reasons these mowers would come into the shop. And a lot of times it would be something that is easily fixed that I would show the customer and they would thank me and it would have saved them 
the hassle and time of coming to deliver their mower to the dealership, to the shop to get, to get worked on. So if I would show them these little things and they could get right back to work and making money. The first most common reason these would come into our shop would be for not starting. If you're turning the key and nothing is happening, quiet, engine's not even turning over. First thing to look at is make sure your e-brakes pulled up, obviously. So if that's not the issue, which our code here is going to show us that that is the issue, and I'll get into that in a moment, but it's because the e-brake, that's why that light is flashing. That's letting us know the e-brake isn't up. But let's say the e-brake is up and I turn the key, nothing's happening. Well, obviously, if those lights are coming on, probably a dead battery. You wouldn't believe how many times people would come in, battery would be dead. Uh, first thing you want to check, make sure they're tight. A lot of times they would just be loose. I'd tighten them up, fire right up. The next thing I would check, if the terminals are nice and tight, I would actually check the battery. You can go to Home Depot, I'm sorry, Home Harbor Freight, and get this. It's $20. Hook it up to your battery. Look at how many cold cranking amps of your battery you have. This one has 300. Um, most of the batteries we would have put on, I think it was either 300 or 350. So you just hook it up, turn it on, press OK. Now you're going to select the cold cranking amps for the battery that we're testing. Select it down to 300. It's testing. So this battery's good. So we know that's okay. So if the battery was good, we're still turning the key. Nothing's Now if the battery's good and you're turning the key, the lights will be coming on. So if it's still not starting, engine's not cranking over, the next thing to check is there's a fuse here. Sometimes there's two fuses, but most of the time the fuse will be right here. It should be a 20 amp instead of a 30 amp. This guy's got a 30 amp in his. Check that fuse. If that fuse is good, your battery's good, then the other possible thing that it could be is the, either the key switch or the starter. Um, the starter, one thing you can try to get you out of a bind is have someone hold the key into the turn position and bump it. Um, that sometimes works. What I would do, give you a, to test whether it's the starter or not, this cable here is always hot. So what you can do is take your screwdriver, and usually I would use two, and so this is always hot, and this is the wire that needs to be hot. When you turn the key, then that gets hot and starts the starter solenoid, starts the starter. So you could pull this down, take a screwdriver, and make contact from this terminal to that terminal. Now make sure before you do that, that your parking brake is on and all that, because it's going to bypass the safety switches, everything, and it's going to make that starter turn. If it still doesn't turn, you probably, the, the starter's bad. If it does turn, you've been turning the key, battery's good, fuse is good, you take a screwdriver and you start the, you turn the motor, you know it's good, it's working. So then it's probably, it's got to be the key switch. And let me tell you a story about these key switches. It was a very common thing. Um, water do not let water get down into this key switch. There was times where if they got rained on, they would, even with the key in the off position, if water gets down in there, it will try to start starting your unit. It'll send power to the starter. So you don't want that happening. It'll wear out the starter, wear out, do a lot of damage. So if you have a key like this, I'd recommend getting the type of key that has a boot over it or if you do have a key like this, just make sure you don't get water down in this key switch. They're really easy to change. You just take this bolt, this bolt, it's a Torx bit there. Take that, it's a 10 millimeter. 
and you have another Torx bit here, take this off and just take a pair of pliers, remove that key switch, it comes down through here and you can replace that pretty easily. Very, very do it yourself type of repair. All right, so let's say that we got our e-brake up, we're sitting down on here, everything's fine, battery's good, we're turning and the engine is turning, but it's still not starting. Well, there's a couple things that could be. One, uh, not very common, but still occasionally would happen, the fuel pump would not be working. If this, this hose here has a crack in it or is broken off, it's not gonna pump fuel. What this does, it takes a vacuum from the engine and it operates the pump. So what you could do is take this fuel line off, turn the motor over, and if it's shooting gas out, well, well, we know it's getting gas. So it could be a carburetor issue. Another issue it could be is this is a fuel shutoff valve. Sometimes those go bad. So you might get power. Sometimes you, I would just check to see if it's getting power to this. You take this out, you take a test light and hit it to that green terminal. And if it's turned, it has to have, the key has to be in the on position. And if it lights up, you're, you're good. You'll hear a little click. You'll hear a little click or you can feel it. When you turn the key, somebody turns the key and if you can feel it, then it's probably working. There's a little um, valve in there that's like this. And then when you when it gets power, it, it lets gas come out. It pulls back and lets gas. And then as soon as it loses power, it shuts the gas off. So that was a common issue. Uh, the other thing you want to check if you're trying to start or maybe you're, it's been lacking power is uh, the spark plugs. You can check the spark plugs. A lot of times that was a very easy uh, fix. Some people would be running on one cylinder for a long time, not realizing their spark plugs need to be changed. Um, the other thing is the coils. You can check the coils, get you a coil tester. They're pretty cheap. Get it, uh, so you, what you would do is, is take this off and plug that plug wire into this. I always like to do two two at a time. So you take that off and plug this to the spark plug, that end there, and plug this into that wire and it and this will light up. You'll see it sparking in there. And so that's letting you know that the spark plug is getting spark. So I would put one on one side, one on the other, and if I was not getting sparked to one of them, it's not that the spark plug's bad, it's that the coil's bad. And I'll probably make another video. It's not too bad. It would probably be a, it's a moderate job to do. You have to remove all this and replace the coils. All right. So another common issue, let's say it wasn't starting. You had a bad battery. They changed the battery and now you're cutting and it's losing power or it sh I'm sorry, it shuts off or it won't start after you cut all day or you cut, you went and made a couple uh, yards and you cut a couple yards and you get back and it'll barely start. Well, now your uh, charging system might not be charging the battery. And the way you want to check that is you can get you a jump box <clears throat> that'll show how many volts are at the battery, or you can get a multimeter and the battery should say when it's not running, it should say about 12 volts or up 12.1 somewhere in there but once you crank it up and rev it up it should say about 14 volts it might on the low end it might say 13.9 13 you know 0.8 but it should be around 14 or higher when it's running when you have your when you're testing what volt you just put your multimeter onto the terminals or your jumper box that'll read and or you can get a uh, jump box like this that it'll has an alternator check and you can check your alternator. Now there's two things that it would be. The most common thing and easiest thing that you could do yourself is there's a rectifier right here. This was the most common reason why it's not charging. So sometimes they look like 
one of these. And a lot of times they're located on this side. On certain engines, they're located on this side. But on these motors, uh, models are located right here. All right, another common issue would be the blades not engaging. Sometimes it's the PTO switch. But most of the time, from my experience, it was either the clutch had gone bad but sometimes it wasn't even the clutch. A lot of times it was the wiring harness, the wires going to the clutch. Sometimes the stick or something might have ripped this harness. Sometimes the drive belt may have, uh, this one's routed pretty good. Sometimes they're routed where the belt's really close and the belt will gr uh, grind away into the, to the wiring harness and also up here it might be a bad connection and a way to test um, if you're even getting power to the clutch take your test light take this apart and put it on those terminals to see if you're getting power to the uh, to the clutch if the mower cranks up is running fine but will not move first thing to check See those little levers right here, this one right here, and that one? Make sure they're pushed in. Now, if you need to ever move the mower, that's the release. So you pull these out. I usually take like a crowbar and pull these out. You can just kind of slip it in there and pull those out. If you ever need to move it, if the mower won't start, you need to move it. If you can't just push it, those hydraulics, that releases the hydraulic um, motors. If your hydro, the levers are pushed in, most likely what's causing you not to be able to move is the drive belt. So you have two belts on these things. You got your belt that's going to the clutch that's going up to the deck, and then you also have one drive belt. Okay? So when the engine's running, this the belt is always turning. This belt isn't always turning until you engage the clutch, engage the blades, PTO. But sometimes I've seen brand new models lose the belt just because a stick or something got in there and threw it off. But just make sure uh, that belt is on. These units also have a safety switch on the seat located right here. If you're not sitting off of it, I mean you're not sitting on it, it won't run. If it's running and the parking brake isn't up, you sit off the seat, it'll stop. That's normal. It's because of the seat safety switch. But sometimes this might cause you some problems with it uh, not wanting to continue to run. Or sometimes it might cause problems with your, if you're cutting and you're bouncing on the seat, it'll cut off. And people think it's something wrong. So that might be the issue. One way to check it or sometimes temporarily solve the problem you take that harness out you make you a jumper like this not saying to do this is might get you out of a bind until you can get that fixed so that's what it looks like with the jumper wire so we're bypassing that switch and this we would often do this just to help us diag diagnose a problem and probably the most common reason these would come into the shop would be a deck noise, a mystery deck noise. So to check for the deck noises, first off, obviously pull that out, clean everything, visually inspect it. One thing that would happen often would be the belt tensioner bearings on this arm would come down and allow this pulley to start getting into the deck. It's already really close already. Okay, so sometimes that would give, if that has any play in it with the belt, when the belt is loose, you want to get those bearings replaced. Should be very little, almost no slack up and down uh, when those bearings are good. And they're permanently sealed, so there's no grease fitting. So there's two bearings need to be popped out. Um, takes an 18 millimeter from, you got to jack it up, 18 millimeter. So that was one common problem, but the most common problem was it was either one of these idlers or the, one of the spindles. So you have to loosen the belt and you, 
if you ever need to change the belt, I'm going to show you a real quick, easy trick of how to loosen this spring. You got to pull this spring off of this. So I'm going to show you a quick and easy way, almost be able to do that one handed. First, take a piece of good quality, strong rope. I always use the rope from a string trimmer. Tie it in a knot in a circle. And take something, I, I use, I'm just gonna use this little ratchet. So I'm gonna try to do this one-handed. And I got it like that, so I can, that ratchet's gonna give me something to grip to. Now, uh, I'm gonna try to get the camera in here, hold the camera while I'm doing this. I'm trying to do this one-handed, I could have already done this by now. Loop it around the string, the spring, like that, and then just pull, pull it loose, pull it loose. Okay, now that I got the spring off, if you were to need to replace the deck belt, the only thing else you need to do now is take a 13 millimeter, loosen this belt guide up. And if your belt is coming off, check to make sure this thing hasn't this uh, hasn't fallen off. Sometimes that would happen. And uh, but to change the belt, you're going to have to take that off because it's just too tight of a clearance between this pulley to squeeze it between the pulley and that little bracket. So now that we have the belt loose, we can check the condition of the spindles. And the pulleys, so that you want it every. You don't want it, the belt touching it while you're trying to spin it. So, give you a. You want to listen for it. Like that one's really bad. That's horrible. Another one, common one. And go out. And that one's bad too. Then you check. You check this one here. Sometimes you just have to feel of it. That one actually feels pretty good. And then while I got this loose, I'm gonna check. So those bearings are bad. It's not getting into the deck yet, but that should not be wiggling up and down at all. So he's got two bad idler pulleys. Now to check the spindles. First thing I would do is I would take the blade Take the blade and rock it up and down. Just move it up and down. This one's bad. This got bad bearings. You can even hear it. You can hear it growling. So he's got one bad spindle. And like I said, if you have the belt rubbing on it, you're going to hear something. That one's bad. I can just hear it. See how much play it has to grab the blade from beneath. That's bad. Now you can try to grease these up and get some more life out of them. I'm not saying he has to replace them right away, but it's uh, going to be needing to be replaced really soon. This one's not nearly as bad. It's got a little bit of play, more quiet. But when you have that play in there and you're making that noise there's no I can guarantee you he hasn't been greasing these enough because sometimes there's loose but if it's not making noise that's just worn from wear but they've been greasing it but if it's sometimes they didn't, there's no play in them and they're growling well it's because the bearings are dry there's no grease and now I'm just going to go over some tools you guys might want to carry on your truck have with you so you can maintain these things and one common thing is you're going to get a pick up a lot of nails in your tires you're going to get flat tires you need to have you a tire plug kit all right learn how to plug a tire and if you don't have an air compressor you're going to need to get you a little air compressor that you can maybe have on your truck or your trailer what i would recommend is getting something like this this is you got your booster box and a built-in air compressor and what i like about this 
is you can set the PSI where you want it and it and it screws onto the valve and then you just set it press the air it compress it airs it up until it goes to this desired PSI you want it and then it shuts off so this would be great for landscapers if you got these mowers dead battery and boost it off check your uh, charging system and you have air uh, to if you have a, a pick up a nail in one of your tires and you can plug it and then air it up and you're back in business another thing to have an impact a half inch impact so you can uh, remove your tires you can remove your spindles it takes a 5 16 socket to remove I'm sorry remove the uh, the blades sharpen the blades common thing you're gonna have to do quite a bit and if you have a flat tire on your trailer or on your mower you need to be able to remove it to fix it whatever carry a battery battery um, uh, impact another good thing about having this you could charge your batteries with this this will charge the batteries. Um, again, get you a battery tester. You can check your current voltage and charging system with that, but you can check the condition of the battery with this. Also, get you a multimeter for you advanced guys who want to check uh, stuff. Get you a, a, a test light, but also carry some fuses. You pop that fuse. Uh, you don't have any fuses. Now you got to run to the store, go grab some fuses, keep you some 20 amp fuses. Look at all the fuses on your mower and carry those fuses with you. Okay, now I'm going to give you guys some advice if you have to get something worked on at a shop or warranty work, whatever. Uh, one thing about warranty work, again, if you don't grease those spindles, you don't, you're not changing your oil, don't have enough oil in it, it's not going to be covered under warranty. Um, if you're mower is under warranty make sure you take it in there before the warranty goes out and when we would get units in that need work done even if they just brought it in for an oil change or something else and that unit's still under warranty we're going to look for everything we can do to that thing that's uh legitimately worn out because we have to supply photos and documentation for all the work that we do. You don't pay for it. John Deere pays for it. But we want to do that. And you want to do that to make sure you got everything, that machine nice and freshened up before uh, it, the warranty goes out. And another thing to make sure before that warranty goes out, one common thing we would see is these things would crack right here. And I would have to, uh, since I was the only welder in the shop, I would... Uh, weld these back up they would break either right here or right there and what would break that is guys running too fast on hitting curbs or popping wheelies and everything make sure these bolts are tight take 18 millimeter these tighten these bolts up make sure they're all tight so what you need you'll notice on the newer models they have two bolts here they trying to correct that problem all right and now for the tip to uh, the two tips Two best tips I can give you for getting your mower fixed cheaper and faster from either a dealership or a repair shop, whether it be a John Deere dealership or not, a mechanics will appreciate this. Oftentimes, they would bring a customer would bring in a unit and say, hey, I'm having a problem, but it only does it after I've been running for an hour or two. So then we're we have the problem of having to drive your unit around, burning your gas, you know, wearing out your mower, blazing everything, trying to simulate the issue that you've told us and be as specific or uh, when you're just try to give us as much details about the problem. But here's the here's one thing. The diagnostics. OK, so, for example, a lot of guys don't know about this. This will help you and the mechanic. All right, I'm going to just show you an example. Like I go to turn the key on and it's not starting. All right, it's not going to start. See how it's flashing? It goes one, one, two. Then a long pause. One, one, two. All right, so what does that mean? Well, you should know what it means. But let's 
Let's say it's flashing something else. Let's say it's flashing two and three. Underneath the seat, diagnostic codes. So that one and two break, not engage. That's why it's not starting. So you have these right here telling you, like if it was uh, flashing three and one, it, you're, say your mower dies while you're cutting and you go to, uh, and it starts flashing that three, it flashes three times and then one. Now that tells us uh, over voltage. I'm sorry, if it, if it was dying, it would probably be weak battery or, or uh, if it's not, it's having a hard time starting, weak battery or starter system issue. Might be flashing three and three. What I would recommend doing, if you ever have an issue out in the field and you see that light flashing, do not turn the key off. Take your phone out and record, or just make sure you know what it's flashing. I would say record it so you can verify later. Because a lot of people just look at it real quick and think it's flashing something else when it's really flashing a different code. This will help save us time, and we can get it back to you faster. It's not going to really save you any money on the repair. It might, unless they have to charge you for going out and writing it for a whole day to find out what the issue is. All right, this is gonna, a mechanic's gonna appreciate this, you're gonna appreciate it. Now the second tip for getting this, this will save you money and time. When you go to deliver your machine to a mechanic, dealership, whatever, clean it, clean it as best you can. Now, I understand sometimes it might have died. You don't have a way to get it on there. Clean it as best as you can. All right. And here's why. One, all the time people would show up with an issue, deck noise, let's say, and it's covered with just grass, horse crap, everything, dog crap. It's disgusting. Or if it's a issue with the battery, everything. This, I, I pressure wash this because it, so it'd be nice and clean for these videos. And this one was relatively clean when it came in, but a lot of times it'll be just be absolutely covered with oil, dirt, mud, weeds, everything just just disgusting. And that's that's also bad for the things aren't going to work right. You know, one time I had one, it was just caked up with mud right here, and they were wondering why their throttle and stuff wasn't working. Well, it can't move because all the dirt. Now. Here's the other thing, mechanic, you show this up, show up with a cl nice clean unit, he's going to be able to, he's going to, it's going to make it more enjoyable, one, to work on, easier to work on, he can get to it and um, fi figure out the problem, repair it, he's not having to worry about cleaning this thing off, because they would come in so dirty that we would literally have to spend 30 minutes Blowing everything off, pressure wash, cleaning it all off, then blow drying it off, just so we can see and get to the uh, nuts and bolts and everything. And when people would bring these units in clean, I would go the extra mile for them. I would do everything I could to help them out. When customers would bring these units in and they're just caked up with mud, dirt, they didn't, they don't care. They're just bringing it in, just covered, just disgusting. I show those guys zero mercy, zero mercy. I'm charging them for the cleaning it, and I'm not going to give them any breaks on labor, any breaks on parts. I'm not giving them a break. I'm showing zero mercy on you guys that are delivering these things. Absolutely, completely disgusting. We're all. If all you did was just brush it off with your, take a glove and brush it off with your hands, I'll show you mercy. I'm not going to show you mercy if you purposely deliver this thing and it's covered up with grass, mud, dirt, cow crap, dog crap, every everything. It will go a long way. I promise you, you'll be shocked. Show, clean it up. Make an effort to clean it and just keep it clean for the sake of, of, of keeping the equipment running. It'll save you money. All right, guys, so this concludes my video about giving you advice on your John Deere zero turns. It'll probably... A lot of this information probably help you other guys out with your Toros and Skags and big boys. Uh, a lot of these use the same components, use the same motors and same spindles and stuff. Uh, just some slight differences, but 
Hope you like this video. Subscribe to my channel, make a comment. And uh, if you want me to make some videos on some other content, other mowers, like some standards or some other issues with those I could go over. Um, or if you want some more detailed information, if you like this video, man, leave a comment. I appreciate you. I appreciate y'all watching and um, just take care of your unit. Keep it clean and keep it maintained. You'll have uh, a lot better experience. Thanks, guys.